of a tiny town settled on a swamp has come a roaring metropolis, fourth city of the world. The Chicago Tribune, truly part of Chicago, meshed with its destiny, has also grown through strikes, panics, violent social and racial disturbances. It has come, each day contributing no mean share to the political, social and economic development of Chicago and the Middle West. The Tribune had helped materially in the building of a world city in the new world. It would give to that city the ultimate in civic expression, the world's most beautiful office building. You're listening to a podcast about buildings and cities. I'm Luke Jones. And I'm George Kinjal. On June the 10th, 1922, on the occasion of its 75th birthday, the Chicago Tribune announced a competition for a new headquarters. Eventually won by Raymond Hood and John Mead Howells, the competition attracted over 200 entries, approximately half of which were from abroad, and which included many of the major figures of the early modern movement. Coming near the beginning of a period of significant conflict within the discipline of architecture, the story of the competition provides a window into the state of the art at that moment one in which the coming revolution in architectural style is only dimly visible and in which the ideological supremacy of Beaux-Arts style historicism is relatively complete, while at the same time clearly struggling with the iconographic form of the skyscraper. The competition has had a long afterlife in theory, history and literature, from Anne Rand's The Fountainhead to the postmodern revival of historical reference during the 1970s and 80s. It's worth noting that a a chunk of the purpose of this is to market the newspaper. And they're a newspaper which, the the byline, is that what that thing is called? The bit underneath the masthead? Is the world's greatest newspaper. (laughs) Um, Not perhaps shrinking from a little bombast. So, yeah. I, th- I rather like this formulation that, that it's the world's greatest newspaper in what they modestly refer to as the world's fourth greatest city. Fourth city of the world. <laughs> yeah. The fourth city of the world. So, yeah. uh, so, it's, it's, um, it's so not qu- so just off the podium finish. Yeah. It's outperforming the average. Yeah. The, uh, so let's on, on the Holloway Road, there's there's three places that do peri peri chicken, really? and one says. The best peri peri chicken from miles around, and the next one says the best peri peri chicken in the world, and then the last one to be made says the best peri peri chicken in the universe. Right. Okay. I haven't seen any of these establishments. That's good. Yeah. Which one would you go to? I would go to the first one. The first one uh, I have eaten at actually, although not the peri peri chicken, and it had fourteen different kinds of fake wood in the interior. I counted them. <laughs> Which led to a really charming, is the strongest stick. It also had a lot of plastic foliage. So, Chicago. Um, it's, Chicago had grown up during the 19th century, and it's sort I mean, as far as, I, if I'm correct, it, it kind of um, owes its wealth to the expansion of agriculture into the prairie and it, kind of westward. And it started at the beginning, as soon as there is significant settlement in America, this is an obvious place because it's the point where the river system of the Mississippi joins the Great Lakes. And it's also, if you're travelling over land, you have to go round the lakes. So there's a pinch point, which connects you north-south across the whole country and east-west. So even when it's trading in canoes, there's lots of canoes going through there. And as the growth or the mineral and agricultural development of the United States occurs... You, it, it effectively has a hinterland, which is something like a quarter of the continental United States or the size of Western Europe. Yeah, and so it becomes the hub of all of the transport networks, the railway network, everything is kind of centred on Chicago. Yeah, and then from that, the speculation on commodities. Yeah. 50 years before, there'd been this huge fire which had burnt basically the whole city to the ground. That created the opportunity to rebuild and also to start to to rebuild using a series of kind of innov- innovations in structural engineering. And so the the context of the rebuilding after 1871 is that you start to see the use of uh, steel 
Well, the steel comes in after the Bessemer process. That's a bit later. The early buildings are rather like British mill construction, cast iron and and masonry and brick. And in fact, some of the advances in the early days, I think, are to do with improvements in brick technology as much as anything else, hydraulically pressed bricks. And you get a series of incremental advances in technology which are driven by material production processes. So as plate glass becomes cheaper or more expensive on the commodities markets, you get more or less, you know. But but the key thing is, by the end of the 1890s, steel is cheap, and for building tall buildings, it's the best solution. There are lots of... There's a big complicated technical story to do with all sorts of things, um, which people argue a lot about, but yeah. I think it really doesn't matter very much. But they're building, and they're building, they sort of... And the buildings are sort of tending ever upwards. There are sort of there are various sort of technical innovations, but it's it's one of the places in the world in which we're starting to push the limits of how high you can build. I would say, in terms of in terms of inner city office buildings, mainly in New York and Chicago, they're they're starting up skyscrapers. Yeah, which initially were not actually especially tall, but would become tall and were engaged in a competition for technical innovation prestige which led a progress towards them getting bigger and bigger and we've we've heard in the readings these these references to sort of civic glorification of the city and part of the reason that was so much in the air is in the years after the the Columbian exposition which was held in 1893 which was you know one of this whole series of international expos which had been going on since the 1850s but was the biggest yet really really huge known as the white city 27 million visitors 600 acres 200 buildings so let's say how big that is i don't know what the population of america was then but it, it can't have been more than 70 or 80 million it's big. Sort, of, sort of thing it'd be very easy to look up it was a big event and they built yeah these like huge kind of wedding cakey very like, serious examples of the advancement of civilization through yeah. um End state classical architecture. All made out of this um, sort of mixture of lime plaster and jute. So it's, it's, yeah. very, it's very much kind of crumbly, temporary. Somewhere, somewhere between papier-mâché and plaster. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, they're all sort of on wooden scaffolds. But so there's this, this wider context of, you know, there's the city beautiful movement. There's this wider context of, like, beautifying the industrial city creating kind of parks and civic buildings. And that's something which has been very, very much in the air as a kind of, you know, topos of um, virtue in uh, in Chicago. I think thinking of it is different at the time. But as we look at it now, there are two competing influences. The influence of technology and capitalism working together. Yeah. These speculative developments, which are not there, but trending towards kind of extruded floor plates stacked on top of each other in the latest and greatest technical innovation being published in Scientific America and then having sort of expressive details significant of the image that their owners want to project, which is sort of trending to boxes rising and also is influenced by kind of municipal requirements and or and a desire by some to civilise this, to uh, make it more in keeping with the legacy of European civilization, great stance of the world, we're going to classify it, classicize it all up, um, instead of being something which is an expression of industrial might and and, and manifested capital. Yeah, it's gonna we're gonna have a future which is beautified and organized and regularized, and we're gonna have city plans, and uh, that's sort of what happens next in Chicago. Which is that there's the big plan, which starts, I think, in 1909? Could be. What's he called? The guy who does does the World Fair, Burnham. Daniel Burnham. Gets himself appointed by a a sort of cabal of businessmen. Yeah. And they develop a plan, get it through the city, and that's what kind of governs the development of Chicago through the 20s. Um, which includes, you know, the, the the subterranean roadways and the big park south of the Loop, and 
is it got a general encouragement towards notions of classism and also the areas and, and ways in which development will take place and the the competition we're talking about is partly it's about creating a gateway piece to this new northern expansion of the central business district great which is just on the other side of the chicago river from well we're still stuck on beaux-arts in the uk it wouldn't be the capitalists that wanted to spend loads of money gentrifying the city now, they were doing it in their own image and sort of for their benefit, but classicism isn't driven by capital here. Public classicism. They might spend loads of money on innovative architecture for their own houses. See the first episode. But they didn't. And banks spent a lot of money on their buildings. Mm. Don't get me wrong. They were a real expression, but they weren't driving... There are these outbreaks of civic beautification, like Joseph Chamberlain, but by and large, I think it's because the wealthy of Chicago... Jo- Joseph Chamberlain is a national politician first. What are you asking? You're asking why didn't a big band of businessmen club no, together in Britain? No, I'm asking why a big band of businessmen would be so interested, would be interested in promoting Beaux-Arts architecture over commercial architecture, over what had been hitherto the commercial norm. Well, they're, be- they're beautifying the city, aren't they? So you you can't you know you can't beautify the city in the in the style of the mundane. You have to beautify the city in using the style of high cultural sophistication. Um, as to why they're doing it with the city is why they're beautifying the city in the first place, rather than their own houses somewhere distant. It's because they're city people, aren't they? You know, their wealth has come up and been developed in this context. That so they they identify themselves with the city in a way which the kind of aristocratic industrialist nexus in Britain never did because it's well, so always a different culture. At, in, in Britain you aspire... You aspire to flee the city. And yeah, uh, and come back for the season. Having uh, the, the key social life goes on in country estates. Yeah, but I mean, where are you going to flee? If you're a Chicagoan millionaire, where are you going to flee? You're going to go and build an estate in Iowa or something. Like, what? Like, yeah, it doesn't yeah. make I think sense. You could get quite a big one if you yeah. wanted. Yeah, I mean, you could. I suppose, like, East Prussia is a bit like that, isn't yeah. it? It's the same, similar sort of landscape. And people did go and build big estates there. So it's not that it would have been impossible, but that's not what they were looking for. What you wanted was a, a grand house somewhere a little way out on the lake shore, but very much still part of the of the metropolis um i think also the plan and i don't know how much this was driven by the architects or the clients of the architects um in terms of the plan is quite beaux-arts as a style rather than we can unpack what beaux-arts means in a moment whereas a lot of the expensive fancy sophisticated buildings immediately prior were not they were in in like proto-modern they were they were still expressions of commercial and technological growth. You know, if you think of something like the Reliance Building or mm. these sort of examples people hark back to as the origins of glass architecture or really swish, but made of industrial products, made of plate glass, cast iron, pressed terracotta, and reveling in these technical innovations as opposed to white neoclassicism. Yeah, so, well, I mean, Louis Sullivan, who's the great Chicago architect, ha- had railed against the architecture of the, of the Columbian Expo. He, yeah. said, he, said, he said that he would he's, take... He's um, the guy from whom form follows function comes, isn't he? Yeah. Um, so I think that that does tell you that there was a change which came over the architecture around that time when kind of capital shifted away from what had been this rather sort of interesting, quite specific, sort of semi-proto-modern... Uh, Chicago style towards this sort of borrowed pompous grandeur of big white stone or plaster or whatever classical buildings French classical yeah. building yeah. yeah it's very French and why does that happen I guess it happens because people have a certain sense that the, that's the world that they want to move towards you know that they I mean, want the, to leave they want to there. it wasn't as if the, the French big white buildings I mean the capital that's a big French white building the white house it's kind of. I'm sort of reaching a little bit here, but I think that that has always been a, a slight, like a dynamic within chi- Chicago culture, is this sense of, you know, are we a, as great a city 
or are we taken as seriously as we ought to be? Well, here we are, we're in the middle of the Midwest, surrounded by fields and fields of kind of bumpkins. Are we being patronised by all the, the sort of waspish East Coast? Yeah, we probably are. And there are different ways that one reacts to that sense of inferiority. You can react by very much having your own kind of style, or you can react by adopting a certain set of moves which appear to successfully connote making it being grand, being at the very highest level, being Parisian, having all of this borrowed glamour and sophistication. Yeah. And I think that that's the thing. That it, yeah. I mean, it's a very long way from anywhere, certainly at this point, yeah. isn't it? And it's a great metropolis, but it, it does also feel... It's also incredibly new. Yeah. America was a much newer place back then. The country wasn't 100 years old when the Great Fire happened. And the country was only probably really regarded as a great power from the 1890s or 1900. I think I think the reality was always a bit further ahead. But this is the long boom following the Civil War. It's the kind of industrial, the change of America from being an agricultural country to being an industrial country. Oh, I wanted to unpack Beaux Art because this is something that I was a bit confused about. So um, we're using, yeah, we're using the term Beaux Arts to refer. It's it's ambiguous what we what we're referring to. So maybe we should be clear. One particular aspect is that architectural theory and education in the United States in sort of late nineteenth, early twentieth century very much looks towards France as its model. And so there is a particular set of architectural theories, approaches, kind of heuristics for design, um, ideas about sort of hierarchy and values and things, which are taken from the École de Beaux-Arts in Paris, or sort of a kind of filtered version of it. And so that that's a philosophy which tolerates a certain degree of stylistic eclecticism. It doesn't all have to be classical it's more a kind of underlying set of principles but there's also this other sense of the Beaux-Arts style if you talk about the Beaux-Arts style which is kind of 19th century very grandiose classical really digested it's through, it's been through the kidneys a bit too many times classicism first we have the renaissance and then we have the baroque or you know and there's all sorts of things between the mannerist and then we have then we have through the 19th century and late 18th century, this huge wave of revivals, historic revivals, the Greek revival, or Egyptian architecture, or... Yeah, and or, then, you know, the Gothic, the... And then the, yeah. you get waves and waves of this, and often they have a political connotation, or a movement of people adopts a certain style. We are, going, we are Republicans. We're going to overthrow monarchy. We're going to be like the Athenians. Yeah. Um... We believe in going back to feudalism. Yeah. We're going to um, be like Pugin and say pointy arch is good, flat windows with rect- rectangular windows, bad, yeah. pagan. Well, and, but over time, this sort of gets more and more mulched and kind of digested and regurgitated and digested until the styles have a notional rhetorical meaning, but they aren't white hot political. And also, that they aren't really the buildings anymore. At the yeah. beginning, like if you were going to do a Gothic house, you would have some notion of what the type of a Gothic house would be. Whereas by sort of mid nineteenth century, it's fine to stick stuff on the facade of a new thing. Style becomes abstracted from function, except as a rhetoric. Yeah, and massing and things. So you know, you could talk about the Palace of Westminster, for example, which. Absent a few towers here and there, it is essentially classical, but with gothic details applied to it. Yeah, which makes sense, given that it was designed by a classical ar- architect who brought in Pugin to do gothic detailing. Oh, so the, just to make it completely clear, yeah, there's, so there's the Beaux-Arts School, yeah. which you can use to refer to all of this stuff, the whole historicism movement, and there's Beaux-Arts style, which is the style of the Opera Garnier or House in Paris or the US capital. So let's talk about the competition. I hope everyone is familiar with what an architectural competition is. It's pretty simple. You've got a building, you have a brief, you have a description of the requirements, and you invite 
architects to submit designs, which are normally judged in the kind of classic version. They're judged anonymously, and whoever has the best design gets to build the building. And they're either open or closed. So you can either have, this is a big difference, you can have competitions. In my experience, most competitions actually are closed. Nowadays, yeah. So they, the competition sets out the site. It sets out rules in terms of what needs to be submitted. There are six drawings. You submit a view from a particular street corner. You submit two plans, a ground floor and a typical office floor. You submit some other orthographic drawings, I think a section and an elevation from a particular side. It's a section and two elevations. Yeah. And so it's two yeah. elevations, a section, two plans and a view. And yeah. the only thing anyone ever sees is the views. That's what they publish. Everything else is, I think, not even published most of the time. And they've got a big cash prize. Yeah, there's a big cash prize. Yeah, there's $100,000 and you get 50 for winning and 25 and... No, yeah. 50, 20, 10. And, and then, then one for honourable mentions or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, then, and then... Yeah, so there's this whole list of all the things, of all the things which are expected from you. No colour allowed. All the drawings are to be anonymous. The competition, although apparently completely open and anonymous, the, the, when organising it, they did beforehand tip off the 10 most prominent architectural practices in the United States. And, and give them £2,000 costs. $2,000 To make costs. sure that they entered. And the plans, I think they were probably slightly taken aback by the number of entries they had. Well, certainly it worked out better than they were expecting. they were very happy. Yeah. I think they really wanted the reason why part of the reason they slipped people the, the bung was they wanted to have this story yeah. of them being the greatest patrons in the world and getting all the important people to bid on their project. So they made it. Normally, competitions have more onerous requirements than this. This is an extreme of big cash prize, very low requirements. The jury was made up of one architect two military officers and two businessmen uh, which is actually quite (laughs) typical of judge it on sort of establishment and actually i wouldn't say the panels today are much better they don't they tend to have fewer soldiers in them yeah there are fewer fewer of them around than there were in the immediate aftermath of the war and we have colonel robert r mccormick member of the jury his photograph is reproduced in the book that we have describing the competition. Does he have good facial hair? He has, yeah, strong, <laughs> like, strong facial hair. He looks I think like... It, I um, think it's pretty... Without even seeing the photograph, I would predict. Yeah, he has almost no facial features apart from his moustache, actually. It's more or less the only thing giving any structure. Yeah, they apparently spent many hours in careful deliberation. I mean, what happened is actually... They, so they opened it up, they got a lot of entries, and then they gave another month for more people to enter as it as it became more evident that lots of people would. And then they had a whole more... Particularly, I think, a lot of the international submissions were, were in the final month. And they had selected their favourite three when, just before they were about to announce it, another packet of drawings came in, in the description, from the little nation of Finland. Yes, they had two two entries at the end from the little... Three! Three, yeah. From the little nation of Finland. Two of which were thought to be good. One of which was thought to not be good. And in the end, they had to revise the top three because one of these Finnish entries was placed second. They're, they're pretty amazing, actually, the entries from Finland. So the, the one which they didn't choose to... which they The one which they rated as being the second best out of them is one of my favourites and which we'll talk about in a little bit. So the, tri- the context in terms of the Tribune is that they had been growing at the same time you know, along as the city has grown and prospered, so the newspaper has grown and has expanded. They'd built a huge new building in 1902, but they'd already outgrown it, and in particular they had a need for more space for presses, because in those days, as, as, as continued in many places up until the 80s, the newspapers were all printed in the basement of the, yeah. uh, of the building where all the journalists were. Amazing, eh? Yeah. It's because you had to do all hot metal presses. Yeah. <laughs> The travel distance between the um, between the journalists and the presses had to be as small as possible. Yeah, he wanted it right then and there. Yeah. So, and they move, and the thing is, they're moving 
absolutely central core to a slightly bigger site just over the river and making a statement about that this is going to be where the future of the city is going to be. And there are all sorts of other advantages. There's less traffic. You can, you know, they can actually ship the papers out much more easily rather than being right in the middle. Well, I think it is worth mentioning the plan because I think that yeah. is the thing that sets it up. A couple of things about the, the development which surprised me when I looked into it briefly. There's a lot of things about the development of civic architecture in Chicago which are not like European cities of this time, which is that it is disproportionately governed by capital. So, obviously, the the great buildings that we think of at this time are commercial buildings and speculative commercial buildings. Even the Tribune was mainly speculative. Most of the programme was lettable space not to be occupied by the Tribune, and this was the norm. Yeah. And... The other thing that surprised me is that the organisation of the plan of the city was not instigated by the city, the mayor, who was a powerful figure, but by a number of business alliances. So I think there's the commercial club, which is formed of basically a, a group of um, capitalists, capitalists in a, working in association, decide to appoint someone to design a plan for the city. And they design it, and then they use their influence to get it through the city. Yeah. And they're in a very good position to implement it, owning the land, being the people who are building these buildings. And they design it very much sort of in their own fashion. And it's a city which really is being led by this huge wealth reaped out of this massive area of um america of the con of the continent of continental america and then being speculated upon and then the the, the buildings being sort of the concentrations of the speculation yeah that's not how we think of cities even in london which is a city which has been traditionally i would say at the low end of state intervention we would not expect a city plan to be instigated by capital. No. The skyscraper, which is something which I think is incredibly culturally significant and emblematic to this period of America and American progress and American exceptionalism, <clears throat> is a real image, the thing. It's really interesting that it's not a cathedral. It's not a fort. It's not a palace. No. It is speculative office space, mainly, yeah. as the pinnacle of the concentration of power. Yeah. And the pinnacle of technical and architectural innovation. And there's a, there's a history there. Anyway, so we'll get on to we'll get on. We'd be doing the boring bits at the beginning of like what the history is, but there's going to be this big meaty bit in the middle where we talk about all the entries, which are yeah, wild. Yeah, so I think I mean we we spoke a little bit about explaining that the dominant approach to architecture at this point is eclectic historicism, that you can select. Those styles are, in theory, you can kind of pick between them. In practice, classicism remains the master style. But there are different reasons for picking particular ones. Different styles were thought to be more or less appropriate to different sorts of buildings. An example of this is that prisons are often designed in the Egyptian style. Presumably... In Aren't they? In America? Yeah, because yeah. here they tend to be Gothic. In England, they tend to be castles in England. Yeah, castles are also appropriate. Uh, castles are, are the classic prison. And this was meant to be more enlightened and civilised to have them as a Gothic pile than what came before, which was rationalists. I assume they're Egyptian as a, a, a reference to the Old Testament. Also, I suppose, because it sort of naturally suits these like very thick walls. Do you need thick. extraordinarily thick walls? I mean, I, I know that's what happens in the Shawshank Redemption, but... Uh... <laughs> I was talking about styles and academism, uh, which yeah. which sort of solves the problem of what, what we're calling Beaux Arts and what we're not. Yeah. So if you went a bit earlier than this, if you go around the Ringstrasse in Vienna, which is the other, along with Paris, I think is, these are the two big cities from which academism comes. There are lots and lots of other places that were very important. If you go around the, the Ring of the Centre, the bourgeoisie constructed the town hall in Gothic style, 
for the Hanseatic Free Cities, the court in Greek for the Republican Tribunal, the bank in the stock exchange in Baroque for the great trading Baroque, you know, and so on and so on and so on. And they're all there. It's quite nice because they're all in a row and they were all built at the same time. Those are the two first big influences. So I think there are three forces at play, which I think are actually present in almost all of the entries. So there's the Beaux-Arts or Academism. There's kind of obviously skyscraper architecture, which is what they all are underneath and certainly the successful entrants understand how it works so you've got to have 20 floors of office space on top of that you have a decorative pylon which you sort of substitute anything you like for there's a plinth the structure is going to be a grid of steel supporting blah 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 blah, blah, blah yeah so i mean let's just break that down so it skyscraper architecture sort of necessitates a regular repeated features because if you if you've got masonry then you've got to go, have the same you've got to have all the windows on top of each other because you've got to keep the force running all the way straight down also if you're going to big build buildings this big you either need a lot of wall on the outside or you need a lot of wall somewhere in the inside without many openings in it so you can either have not many windows or you need these massive racking walls inside the building which mean you can't rent out big offices and mean it doesn't work you need a stack of plates. So we've got our influences. We've got, yeah, the, the kind of the academic approach, the skyscraper architecture as it has been up to this point. And what was the other one? European avant-garde, um, of which modernism is a part, or proto-modernism. Yeah. I would say that's the other big category of influence. What, in the entries? Yeah. And I think the avant-garde, rather as academism has a lot of sub- subsections, there's quite a lot to what a skyscraper is. Avant-garde architecture has, is very broad church at this point. Expressionism is different to whatever it was that Loos was doing, is different to whatever it was that Gropius was doing. So I think we should take them one by one. So if we were to talk about them as different groups, the approach of the, the academists... Although I would say, actually, that I think all of them have some... Well, some of them have no academism, but nearly all of them have got some combinations of these influences. Yeah. The skyscraper poses this problem as a building type. In theory, all styles are kind of equal. The um, the classical is definitely the master style. It's definitely the style which you would default to unless you have a reason to go with one of the others. But building a tower in the classical style is innately difficult because there aren't really any precedents to follow. In fact... To, to give a bit of context, there was a big argument in British architecture in the early 19th century about whether it was acceptable to have a classical building with more than one story. Right, yeah. So there, there's our problem. Soane said no. <laughs> Which is why the Bank of England was built in the middle of London with one floor. Yeah. The aspiration of what you're trying to create with this sort of approach is something big, singular, monolithic, unified... Which is fine, but you also, these rooms are going to need windows and there really should be a relationship expressed between the inside and the outside, at least in terms of the nature of the spaces. And those two things are in conflict. I think finally there is a problem which is to do with the nature of the spaces inside a skyscraper. If we were to lay out all of the spaces inside the 19th century classically styled building, like the US Capitol or something like that, you would have like really big spaces all the way down to really, really little ones. You have this sort of family of spaces of different sizes from the big assembly chambers for the various houses or the big sort of central space of the library or these big kind of public spaces all the way down through the variously different sized meeting rooms, committee rooms, down to offices, down to little service spaces. And between all of those different sizes of spaces, there is hierarchy. Um, And that it's understood that the building is assembled out of a hierarchy of spaces of different sizes. And these sort of evolve out of palaces, really. Yeah. 
within the skyscraper, you don't really have any big spaces. You might have the lobby, you might have one or two others, but what you tend to have actually is the repetition of a single floor plate over and over and over again. And that means that you have nothing really with which to generate hierarchy at the level of the plan. And so the building, you're trying to impart a certain sort of monumental seriousness to something which, in terms of its, its layout, feels really industrial. And it creates a, a, a real discomfort at the level of the, of the values of the design. Beaux Arts tradition that subscribes to old world notions of the virtue of different activities, putting aristocracy at the top and the church and things like that. And this is about work. Yeah. This is a big stack of offices, and what goes on in those offices is pretty mundane. Yeah. People sell stuff to each other. You've got to make these little, are not terribly exciting in and of themselves things, monumental. Something I think about the eclecticism and the problem of skyscrapers and the notion that, that a style of pra- a pragmatic style of skyscrapers had evolved, which is a rectangle with a load of rectangles on it, portrait, tall, looking like a skyscraper, with some sort of pointy thing on the roof, that had evolved but was always in contention. Actually, the early ones were often very ornate and quite strange. But what had evolved very definitely was a structural system, which was a steel box grid. The win- and you put the windows in the boxes. And that meant that if you didn't want to do much else, you were left with a building which would kind of look the same. Until you, until you decided to clad it in a particular way, and then use the structural flexibility to express rhetorical shapes. In a Gothic cathedral, the reason it's a shape is because that's sort of... If you wanted to build something that tall with that big a hole in it, you had to do something a bit like that. You had a degree of flexibility, but not a very great one. The reason the windows are pointy is because that allows a better span, and it allows you to have taller, thinner columns that don't splay out. That's why they're pointy. But in the skyscraper, you've got a steel frame and you can do whatever you want. And it gives you a generic thing to do, but it also means you can do anything else. What creates this peculiar, like, efflorescence of every style under the sun, every approach that you can possibly imagine, this incredible creativity, eclecticism, and also profound strangeness, in a way, the aspiration for what the Tribune Tower has to be has two parents specifically in Chicago. One is the Chicago style of architecture, which is an architecture which makes the best of um, masonry and steel frame construction. These regular grids of windows, which uses new materials for cladding, like, um, you know, terracotta, um, you know, uh, bronze, these different sorts of things which can be allowed to add quite a lot of richness and decoration, but in a pragmatic way and the other kind of parent of it is the Columbian Exposition which is which are these enormous palaces very much expressing a certain image of European style classical grandeur and the aspiration for the Chicago Tribune Tower is to do the former with all of the values and grandeur and kind of virtue of the latter. And there are all sorts of inherent reasons why that's difficult to do, actually. And what's fascinating in the entries is seeing people trying to work out that inconsistency, that tension. Attempting this had been going on all the way through the Chicago style. The skyscraper, in fact, evolved out of tall buildings that were not trying to be skyscrapers. They were trying to be very tall, but they didn't know what they would turn out like, and they often were historicist, though not always. But they, but they hadn't set out to do it quite so explicitly yes, as this. Yes, and they hadn't attempted quite to capture so completely the, um, the sort of the values and the approach of the Beaux-Arts or sort of academist school of 
massing and composition within the context of a skyscraper? It's a very difficult thing to apply both art to because it doesn't make any sense. No. So maybe we can talk about this more by actually looking at some of the entries and we can we can talk a bit about the problems as they appear in some of the designs submitted. So should we start by looking at the winners? It's one by Raymond Hood and John Mead Howells, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah. They're the ones. <laughs> and theirs, like many of the designs, are theirs is a broadly gothically styled um, entry. It's a bit easier to do a gothic styled skyscraper because, at least in the gothic, you do have quite a lot of towers, and you also have this very pronounced verticality at the level of the of the detail, uh, which sort of lends itself to the expression of these piers in between the windows. And so, theirs theirs is one of the biggest genre of entries are a tower with a plinth at the bottom, and then. A skyscraper for 20 stories, yeah. as in there are vertical bands of windows, there's not much going on in the facade, there's a little bit of decoration, yeah. and then a thing on top which is decorative. Yeah. Which is like a lot of them are, you extrude a chunk of the floor plate up, yeah. you have a band at the bottom with a bit of decoration in it in whatever style you want, and then it goes all the way up to the top of the rented space, and then you put something on the roof to make it look like something. And they put on the top. Uh, is it like a, is it like the top of a gothic spire? Yes. Not a pointy spire, like flying buttresses um, out from a central core. They have these um, more exaggerated or more pronounced bands of masonry, which become flying buttresses at the top, and they surround in a ring this little sort of mini tower, which is coming up from the centre of the plan, and it creates this um, big lantern at the top. And then subservient to the tower are lots of lots more office space sort of around it. Yeah. Like 15 stories tall, which is kind of designed to look as little as possible, really. Which actually accounts for quite a lot of the floor plan. Well, there's not... What is there to say about it, really? It's got, it's got these sort of slightly chamfered corners. I think one of the things which it does successfully in terms of the approach is that it alternates between thicker and thinner. If you imagine these vertical piers of masonry in between the windows it creates big contrast between the thicker and the thinner ones and that allows this sort of sculptural effect of these really thick ones to push into the background slightly the the repetition of the windows so that the whole thing feels more like this big gothic sculptural expression of verticality reaching all the way up and that the sense of this grid is very dissipated by that. And I think that's part of what a lot of these historical entries are um, striving towards, it is a way of making the grid of windows sort of slightly, well, quite like much less evident. Yeah, dissolving it into lines and cross lines. This is also something that is very clearly prized, yeah. as in a lot of the things that have a medal or a star of some sort on them in the catalogue, are things that manage to turn the facade from being something which is a grid of windows into something with a grid of windows in it that's something slightly less, while maintaining the overall form. The other thing I think it does quite successfully is make a big plot in, like, seem very much like a tower, which is probably a sixth or less yeah. of the plan of the building is actually the tower, but most of the rest of it is still very tall. They've managed to hide a lot of building. If you look at the plan, have you got the plan? The tower is just that bit in the corner. It's just this. It's not a sixth, it's like an eighth of the plan. Do you mean the tower as in the bit which comes above the with the flying buttresses around it, or do you mean the whole tower? I mean the whole tower. Yeah, so there's a very long bit. So it's a long, thin site, actually. The And the brief specifies that the... the the kind of tower bit is the the bit at the important end of the site, but sort of stretching back behind that is more um, is a sort of six story building, isn't it? Uh, no, uh, some of it is it, it it's in it's in several chunks. This plan. plan. This is the tower. I I literally mean the overwhelming majority of the plot was built on, but they've managed to create a thing where it looks like this slim 
tower, which means that it feels tall and elegant-ish, um, in a way that it wouldn't if it was a slab. Like, if you go in London, the Bishopsgate Tower, that really wide one, it just doesn't look good when you see the wide end, because it's really wide, and tall, wide buildings read scalelessly and look dumpy. And the thin ones aren't really commercially viable. And I think they've managed to create the impression that it's this thin tower, but hiding like 40, 50, 60% of the floor area in in everything else that is sort of a buttress to it or a ancillary structure of some sort, but actually is the building. Should we talk about second place? One of the Finns is Elil Sarinen, who... I don't know if his, this may be his first appearance in America, but he goes on to become a pretty significant yeah, figure yeah, in American point, architecture. I he'd been to America. Yeah, but he would go on to um, yeah, move to America and do an awful lot of work, also with his son, who became one of the big figures of post-war American architecture. So it's another Gothic-styled one. Although less literally. Yes. What it does differently is that where the hood and mead howls entry makes the corners disappear by chamfering them off and concentrates the visible mass in these bands which is a little bit to either side of the middle of the block it instead solidifies the corners which become these sort of expressed big expressed stepping buttresses where the masonry is thicker where the windows seem kind of closer to the surface and what it dissolves is these bands in the middle of the skyscraper which then go all the way up and because the the building is stepping back and getting smaller it steps back one two three four five six times visibly at least getting a tiny bit smaller each each time but what it allows is for the the visible width of the lantern at the top of the tower extends all the way down into the greater mass at its thickest point at the bottom so there's this consistent vertical series of stripes which run all the way from the bottom to the top. But at the same time as they're consistent, the visual density increases towards the top, compensating for the fact that it's smaller, which creates something of, uh, if not a false perspective, then a sense that the top has got a lot going on. It drags the eyes away from the plain bits to the verticality. Uh, and it pulls it up. I actually count nine, because you've got to remember that this proposal still has these funny bits of side building, which step in as well. So they step into the tower in a few goes, and then the tower totters up. And he also uses he uses sculpture, at, which is proposed to sit at these points where the building is pinching in a little bit, which also creates this greening and additional drama at each of those points. Uh, and then should we talk about third price? So the third prize, which is by Hollabird and Roche, uh, we should say first and third are both um, American firms who'd been tipped off about competition um, and paid to enter. And theirs is a very strange hybrid of classical and Gothic references. It's a sort of very solid, expressed, cuboidal plinth, which extends up actually about two-thirds of the, of the way. And towards the top, you have, again, these vertical bands of masonry, the vertical piers, which are expressed and pressing forward of the mass. But up at the top, they turn into something which is as if they become the flattened portico of a Doric temple. So you have the bands, which had been these bands between the the windows, become the pilasters or columns, and then have a little, very blank, very abstracted pediment sitting on top of them. But then on top of that is something which looks like it comes straight out of a medieval cathedral. So it's a real pick and mix. The, it has this really big kind of cathedral-like gothic window, very deeply recessed with lots and lots of rings of masonry around it. And with these four, what would you call them, these four strange towers? This one is a real strange one. I can see completely, although I don't think the, 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 the winning one is especially interesting. Yeah. I can see completely why it would win. It is resolved. It works. The second prize is good. Resolved. It works. It does what it set out to do. I can see why it would mm. do well. 
This one is weird. This one is getting into the weird one. There's an awful lot of weirdness in this but competition, also, but it's starting here. It also, it, you can't, this one I also think is weak. If you see it, I don't know. The, I think I kind of like it. If you go, if you look at the elevation where you can see around the corner, it also features an absolutely enormous sculpture of a standing man with an enormous hat on. I wonder if he's meant to be Abraham Lincoln. I wonder who he is. He's got all... I've got no idea. He's got a real Lincolnish aspect, very sort of tall and um, stringy looking. It's it's very <laughs> funny, but huge, like like huge. like a, uh, like a seven story tall statue. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's very funny. The building is very strange, and it's pointing to something that we'll see later on, which is this real weird mishmash that people will start to do. Part of which I think just comes from these guys, these Americans. They knew exactly what. The, an office tower, a skyscraper was, and then they had been instructed to make it the most beautiful one of those in the world. Which means borrowing from European. It means specifically repressing what the thing is in itself. And these entries are the product of that um, that repression. It's a chimera. Yeah. Not the strangest one we'll see. No, by no means. So I would like to I would like to fast forward to one which I think really brings out. The, the difficulty which a lot of these are, are facing. If we could, if we could talk about um, John Wincoop's scheme, it gives us a way into the crisis which is unfolding in the style. So this is a scheme. This is this guy. I think actually submitted multiple schemes. This is one where <laughs> what he's gone for is that almost the entire block, almost the entire actual skyscraper, is expressed as being a sort of rustic plinth in which the windows are given this aspect. They, they sort of look like kind of basement windows, very deeply recessed with these arches they're on also, top. They're also a square ionic column, flutes carved into it. So if you imagine just a square column going up with flutes, the flutes are the windows. It's it's very peculiar. So the, that whole thing is made to feel subterranean, and then it turns into this transitional series of plinths, and then... Which you've got something of a classical dock. It's got architecture which is taken from classical civil engineering. And then there's another plinth on top which has a sort of frieze around it. And then on top of that, right on top of the building, there is a perfect little uh, Roman temple. It's quite fun, yeah. It's also surprisingly, for all of that, surprisingly plain. It's not very ornamented. Sort of maison carré. And it has an adjunct a completely standard yeah. bit of office block stuck on the side. Which has kind of um, been been slightly um, coloured so as to fade into the background. You, you really see the weirdness emerging here. The kind of proper classical bit is just the lantern and everything else is striving to disappear from view. <laughs> Very many of them put big temples on top. Yeah. This seems to be what you do on the top of a tower. Well, it's one of the options, isn't it? Part of the brief, almost, is to put some random aesthetic thing on the top. And what could be more beautiful than a Greek temple? Yeah, should we, um, do you want to pick some? I like this, like, German one. Number plate 84 on page 90. It's got a giant Germanic armoured figure on top. Huge statue. Wearing wow, like a yeah. crested helmet. Yeah. And the bottom is... And then the rest of it is, is it's sort of all Roman... It, it's like a load of a pile of Romanesque buildings on top of each other. Yeah, like it's a massive all, German on top. Yeah, kind of styled a bit like St. Mark's in um, Venice or something. But then with something else completely different on top. Something else on different on top. And the, the statue, again, yeah, is like a ten-story statue on, <laughs> on top but of the why, building. Why is it this, like, medieval German... I've got no idea. Yeah, who is he? Like who medieval, is he? I think it's like a picturesque medieval German. Yeah. They're, um, which one? The thing is that they are, they are all like this. It's quite difficult to choose. <laughs> the Venetian one, plate 94. Is that Venetian? But with the tomb of Cyrus the Great on top of it? 94? Oh, that was uh, 91. 91. 94 is a uh, oh, yeah. Gothic cathedral. Yeah, so 91 has, yeah, they're, they are like sort of Venetian-styled arches with uh, freestanding columns and then a kind of rusticated wall behind them. But they're very, very tall and thin. And then, yeah, there's, yeah, there's 
this kind of classical mausoleum on top. So we talked about how, how styles are appropriate for particular things. But what is clear here is that these people think any style is appropriate for anything. Well, I think that they—they well, they don't know. They don't the know what the 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 problem the the crisis that they're facing is that there isn't really a style. The style which is appropriate for this is skyscraper style. Yeah. But skyscraper not to do it. skyscraper style is not suitable for a, the project of civic beautification of Chicago because it has to be something grander. But than that. the skyscrapers in Chicago had been like this all the way through. There had been, if you think of, um, do you know, it got knocked down the. Women's Christian Temperance Union Temple, mm. which was for a while, I think, the largest or second largest building in Chicago. Mm-hmm. It's definitely not skyscraper style. So, uh... so let's have a look. So, uh, well, here's the one by Daniel Burnham, which is well, it's actually quite skyscrapery this one. But it, you know, and you can see that that's probably why they didn't want to go for it. He's made some concessions towards. Um, beautifying it with these sort of gothic finials on all of the corners um, and the tops are styled a little bit like Jacobean mansion or something but it, essentially it's pretty pragmatic and did it get an honourable mention? It did, I think they probably had to give him one There's lots with domes on top Oh here's a round one Which is Jarvis it? Hunt, Chicago What number is that? 118 round neoclassical is also trying to be smaller scales really funny because the tower isn't super big by today's standards and in fact there were towers that had been built at double this height in america before this people have different notions of how to represent scale yeah how big to make it there's william drummond's the one on page 134 which is an extremely bizarre entry shown with a rather exaggerated perspective but the the top of which is a, i'm not sure what the word is it a baldakin or something it's this purely it's covered in bronze it's got these huge bronze lanterns what how do you how do you even how do you describe that this one's one of the good ones it's very mad and i don't know how seriously he can have taken it but he obviously took it somewhat seriously the bottom is very robust, tough skyscraper grid. Yeah. Feels like it's made of concrete. Yeah. And that goes up 12, 15 stories or something. And then it takes a step back and it has a funny decorative layer. Yeah. And then the building steps in and a master structure kind of emerges, which has got these four pylons, stone blocks which goes up for a bit. And then on top, there's this really big, tough and strange rectangular uh, structure on the roof. It's all covered in bronze. It's got these huge sort of bronze-lined niches. Um, It looks a bit like a kind of First World War memorial or something, but but in a very very Italian style. It's like a rectangular slab going up. Um, of which the middle has been carved out and replaced with, yeah, these two niches, which but they're not they're they're quarter of a circle, yeah, cut in bronze lined, yeah, an industrial component, yeah, with these massive like fire braziers, but sty- styled a bit like the um, Victor Emmanuel monument in Rome or something, yeah, but also. Like some sort of industrial facility. Yeah, yeah. It's a very strange fusion. We've actually not even started to get onto the most bizarre ones yet. We're still, we're still just doing. Yeah, these are just, the, these are just the ones. I mean, actually, I think that is one of the more bizarre ones. Yeah, that I one think is quite William bizarre. Drummond's is, is, in terms of its rhetorical position, is strange, um, because it's, in some senses, kind of conventional, but, yeah, it's off. Yeah, well, I think we, it's great. We could talk. We could talk about one of my favourites, which is another one of the Finnish entries, that of Einar Sjöström and Jarl Eklund, which I think was thought to be the second best of the Finnish entries, in which the building is sort. Of, you can divide the building more or less in half at the horizontal midpoint. Below, <laughs> it's as if 
there are a series of five Gothic cathedral windows which have been stretched downwards so that they run up the entire height of the building. It's a little bit like some like um I'm always coming back to kind of things that you can do in Rhino, but um, it's like the kind of Rhino click and drag, maybe points points on and drag. Yeah, I think it's more AutoCAD. It's AutoCAD yeah. stretch. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so that's that's where all of the accommodation, the office accommodation is basically from there below. The entire thing is black with these bright um, white windows. And then above the horizontal midline, there is... A, something which looks like a, a kind of reversed gothic cloister ambulatory running across al- the top of it and then the rest of it is an enormous incredibly pointy roof which is literally half the height of the skyscraper which has this single incredibly tall and thin gothic window which runs all the way up the middle of it the roof is it, it extremely expressionist gothic yeah. it's like tears getting smaller they feel like the grid of the Crystal Palace or something like that with pointy bits on top. A baddie lives in it. It's definitely, it looks... It, uh, the... <laughs> cackling. Someone yeah. is cackling with yeah. a phone. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's kind of, the aesthetic is a sort of essentially Batman. Yeah. It's, it's the... is he, but it's evil. But evil it's Batman, evil, yeah. Yeah, it's extremely evil. If, if, if evil Batman became Pope... Yeah. It's the kind of thing he might build. <laughs> I mean, a lot of these are Gotham City. This is sort of the same. Yeah, it's very Gotham. Hello, listeners. George here. At this point, the episode was getting a bit long, so we've broken it into two bits. See you soon. Keep on the way from harm, sad song, misery. They'll never want to see a record.